Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of ADC. I am really happy to be bringing you and our panelists, including our AI-generated Jay LaBeouf over there, uh, to this panel on AI innovation in music, audio, and the law. Um, there's so much to get through today, so we're going to quickly, I'm going to quickly introduce ourselves and what the topic is, and then we will go right to it. Uh, my name is Heather Rafter, and I uh, am the founder of a law firm called Rafter Marsh. Um, you might have seen some folks from our firm wandering around. We focus on the audio industry. This is a topic on which I am very passionate about. Uh, we represent a lot of clients who are here today and at other trade shows. Um, before that, if any of you are old enough to know, uh, I used to be the general counsel of DigiDesign. So um, long before AI was a concept, or perhaps not, Bobby Lombardi might talk a little bit about the early days of AI. Nonetheless, let me quickly tell you what the topic is about, and then we'll introduce the other panelists. And uh, many thanks to ADC uh, for sponsoring not only this panel, but Woman in the Law, something I'm very passionate and committed about and see some other participants uh, in Women in the Law and sponsors here in the audience. Um, okay, our topic, ready? I'm gonna speak quickly. Since the emergence of AI into the daily life of humans around the globe, the societal and government laws surrounding AI have been continually pushed to their boundaries. This trend can be witnessed through discourses on the topic of AI as an author and creative force, to legal case about AI, aka artificial intelligence, harms towards privacy, and to AI's claimed use in artist royalty distribution. This panel will focus primarily on AI as a creative force and seek to identify how AI is currently used in music and audio, potential authorship and ownership issues, and what the future of A may mean for the music and legal industries at large. And because this is ADC, and we cannot get too detailed, never go too detailed in terms of coding, we're going to also talk about some of the challenges of gathering the data you need for AI. So we're going to go pretty deep and broad all in one panel. Um, this panel will distill down cutting edge and fundamental issues raised by the ever-evolving field of AI in our industry. The questions were actually based on age-old questions, include namely, ready? One, how do we best protect creativity? Is that human creativity and innovation? Copyright law has always been about finding the right balance between protecting the rights of authors and not stifling creativity through overprotective means that de-incentivize de human inspiration. As the intellectual property clause of the US Constitution states, copyright laws are in place, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So we're gonna talk about who are authors, who are inventors. And we're also gonna talk about, Jay especially, how do we ensure that the fundamental defining characteristics of who we are, our personas, our voice images, and how we even think stays unique and private to us to the extent we want that, and how we can ensure it can't be used by others, another machine or person without our consent. So that's the broad framework, and um, I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so we're gonna start with Chris Cook, and I'm so excited who we have here to go rapidly and quickly to talk about these topics. OK, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Cook. I um, run a company here in London called CMU. We say we exist to help people navigate and understand the music business. So we are news providers in the music business. We do lots of research and consulting in the music business. And we do lots of training and education. And although we cover the entire business of music, we are best known for our research and consulting and training around copyright and intellectual property um, and navigating music licensing. And so, yes, I'm kind of coming at this from the sort of copyright intellectual property standpoint. And uh, before that, a lawyer. Oh, I, I have a law degree. So uh, I, I have a legal background, but I'm not a lawyer. So that means I understand how the law works. But because I'm not actually a lawyer, 
I can, um, I can criticize the legal profession in a way that lawyers can't. So uh, I often sit in the middle and uh, play devil's advocate. <laughs> uh, but very talented in this area. By the way, I am a lawyer licensed in California and also in England and Wales. So, um, okay, and we've got other lawyers here who will chime in when this is going to be very interactive. All right, Harriet, we just pulled Harriet in during the Women in Audio luncheon. Okay. <laughs> yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm Harriet. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from a uh, Harriet Box. Drury. Drury, yeah. Uh, I'm a musician turned audio engineer, well, hopeful turned audio engineer, and I based my final year research around practical applications of machine learning for musicians. So that basically involved me figuring out what already exists, what gaps exist, what I can use, and what I can use where it doesn't just replace me as a musician, you know, where I can, where I can integrate it into my workflow, maybe where I can find some new workflows, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. We are so excited to have you here, Harriet. And uh, sitting at the far edge, Alex Wankhammer. Um, and Alex uh, started a company called Sonable, happens to be a client of our firm, and we've been a huge supporter of all you do. So, and he's been on panels before, so thank you. Yeah, thank you for you having me. You can't be here. a client of our firm without being on our panels, right? <laughs> True. But think about it. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm one of the co founders of Sonable. Um, it's a company based in Austria. Uh, we focus on plugins, and mainly we call it AI assisted plugins. So, plugins that support you in the mixing process using some AI technologies. And the um, best known products are the smart products, like we have a smart EQ, smart compressor, smart uh, reverb. And we also did. Um, the fast plugins with uh, Focusrite, maybe you heard about them. They've been recently been released um, and should support people who are getting into the world of uh, audio production. And yeah, I myself have a background as a DSP engineer mainly. So I was doing signal processing and programming in the beginning, and now I'm more in the field of product management. Thank you, Alex. All right, and uh, that actually is a real person. That is not an AI-assisted replica of Jay LaBeouf. Uh, Jay worked with me way back when at Digi Design, uh, has been a client of the firm, so proof positive. Uh, you do get wrestled into doing these panels. <laughs> and now he's also uh, a client with a company called Descript. I don't know how many of you know Descript. Hey, Jay. Good morning, Heather. Good morning, Heather. 8 a.m. in California. <laughs> 7 a.m. in California, even better. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Thank you so much for 7 a.m. Wow. All right. We hope you have your coffee. Right. So oh, I, uh, when I first met Jay, he worked on something called machine learning. Can someone here tell us what's the difference between machine learning and AI? I just threw that out as I didn't prepare them for that question. Um, I, like, that's actually a question we get quite often. And I would say like AI is just the umbrella term for different techniques. Machine learning is a subfield. And deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. So it's basically all AI. Then you have machine learning, and then you have deep learning. So to put it really like, it's a very coarse explanation, I think, but that's that work for everyone? OK. Um, is AI really new? Jay, I think you were working on machine learning, and Bobby Lombardi is in the audience, too. Guys, you were working on this in DigiDesign back when? Uh, it's for when we first started having some real prototypes that were impressive in 2007. Uh, we actually had something that could virtually mix a recording session in about 2007, 2008. Bobby, do you want to throw in something? When were you working on uh, machine learning and AI at DigiDesign? It was probably around a similar time. It was a little earlier. It would have been, um, gosh, it would have been two, 2000, I guess, or two, uh, 99, 2000 at DigiDesign. But it was at Stanford with um, Nolan Gasser, um, essentially doing uh, machine listening for timbral listening, and then ended up going into the Pandora algorithm. OK, well, we're going to talk and give you go into depth right now in the details and why all of a sudden AI is the big buzzword. What's changing? Is it because of the greater access to data? So we'll talk a little bit about that. But before, Chris is going to help bundle us in the terminology because we have perfectly represented on this panel assistive AI, right? Isn't that what Alex is doing, kind of creating applications? That's what we decided the other day, wasn't it? We came up with our terminology. Using AI <laughs> to create audio applications. So how many people here are actually doing more what Alex is doing and using AI to create audio applications? Show your hands, please. OK, how many want to be doing that, right? You want to know how to do it legally. All right, 
And then we have Harriet, who is using AI or wants to do more in that area of AI for creation of music. How many are in that space? All right, we got a handful there. And then how many people are involved in the area of AI machine learning generative? Is that what we called it? Yep. AI. You want to explain a little bit, Jay, what we mean by that term? Absolutely. Generative AI is when the AI is going to be creating media content or augmenting media content that hasn't existed before. So taking some input from the user and creating entirely new outputs from it. How many are working in that area? All right, is there an area of AI that someone's working on that's not covered by this panel and you want to shout it out? All right, so we got a pretty good sample, we agree. So uh, folks want to understand now probably what they're doing to create their AI modeling, right? So we're going to get into that right now. Who are we starting with? We're going to start with you, Alex. You want to well, ask us, do you want us to ask you questions, Chris? Well, I, I guess, or, or do you want to just initially introduce the, the, the business and the product? Oh, a, a caveat. I promised Alex that we would not get into the specific legalities of uh, anything his company does because this is one of the issues you should all know about AI and how you gather the data. It is definitely an area that has not been fully, um, what's the word you would use? Clarified. Clarified, okay. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna talk generalities and then we'll do some Q&A and uh, if you wanna go more granular. Okay, Alex. So uh, I just start like by what we are doing and probably the terms that you need to better understand what we are doing. So. Um, if you look at it as a, from a course perspective, um, there are maybe two ways of using or of, of, of implementing AI technologies. One is more model-based and one is more data-based. Uh, and if you look at the history of AI, in the beginning, everything was model-based. So you kind of programmed everything by hand. For example, a chess game computer just knew all the rules and the value of each figure. And then if there was a move, then it computed all the different uh, combinations and, and um, yeah, made the next move. And um, the good thing about that was, or the thing is that you needed a lot of domain knowledge. You needed to exactly understand the process behind it to be able to model it. Uh, but it also, the downside of it was that it's limited. So it's limited by the model. If you miss something, it's just not working. So for a lot of, um, of approaches, there was a glass ceiling and you just couldn't go through that. Uh, and afterwards with uh, machine learning techniques and then specifically deep learning, um, things changed because these systems extract all the information they need from the data itself and they learn how to accomplish a certain task. So you don't have to specifically program it to do something, but they look at the data, they find patterns inside the data, and then they do the task. Great thing is, it's very powerful, and it gets more and more powerful the more data you have. The bad thing is, or the difficult thing is, if it doesn't work, you often don't know why. Because it's like a deep neural network is more or less a black box. There are ways to look into it, but more or less a black box. Um, and it's an interesting tool um, and for us, for example, we, we all came from the classical signal processing world with feature extraction, extraction and everything, where you needed a lot of domain knowledge. And it was hard for us somehow to accept that this new technology is something where you don't need that much domain knowledge. Still, it's a great technology, but we combine model-based approaches and database approaches for most of our products because model-based approaches are much easier to fine tune. Database approaches are much better in what they're doing. So. Okay, so in case any of you are thinking, hey, I want to compete with Sonobol, this is going to be really easy. I'm going to cut myself my own deal with focus, right? Just uh, Alex told me, for example, on an average plugin, just to go back to your data-driven part that you still do, uh, each product he makes, you look at, uh, I don't know what the right word is, help me out with the right word, just kind of <laughs> look at. <laughs> About a million and a half songs per product you develop? It depends on the product, obviously, but we need, you need really need a lot, a lot of samples to, to be able to, because the system, it's easy to train a system to be good in, some, in a set, certain task, for example, fix the Q curve for a piano. But if you want to generalize, like for all the instruments out there or for, for different instruments, you need a very good mixture, uh, a good sample base. So otherwise it's biased towards certain things. Is it generally true the more data, the better the result will be? Um, no, Depends on the quality of the data, obviously. Like the, that's, that's one of the things why um, some AI systems are still limited is because um, f at least for classical supervised uh, AI learning, you need high quality data um, to train the system. 
So if you would train the system on bad data, you will also like you will never get good results. So the quality of the data is really important, and the amount of data is also really important. One of the things I, I like is we always think about diversity and inclusion. And in fact, I asked Alex, I'm like, Alex, do you just kind of listen to pop songs? What are you doing to gather your data? And uh, he mentioned they listen to, they have to listen to all different types of world music all around in different genres and, right? Yeah. Because otherwise, like, yeah. You could limit it to pop, for example, but then it, the system would be limited to pop. So that's why we try to at least extend it as, as far as we can. Yeah. You mentioned the hierarchy of AI, which I think we can agree is this slightly abstract term that doesn't really mean anything, which is why any startup can say they're an AI startup, because we can't really define AI, so anything can be an AI startup. Um, then you have machine learning, and then you went one step further, which was deep learning. So I guess at what point does machine learning become deep learning? Um, it, it, it's always a blurry line. There is no kind of exact separation. But the main difference maybe is if you do machine learning, normally you have to still tell the system what parts of the data are relevant. So it's called feature engineering. For example, you extract, for audio, you extract MFCC coefficients and spectrocentrates, whatever, like low-level features. And you feed these features into some classifier or whatever you want to do. And then the system works on that and, and does everything on its own. So it finds the patterns using these features. And for deep learning, normally this first feature engineering part is missing, and the, the system itself does the feature. So it's called automatic feature engineering. So there is no limitation at all. So even uh, you could, for example, you can, you can let a system work on, on a spectrogram, which is already feature engineering in some way. And there are systems that are work on the actual waveform. And then they trans like the first layers you have are more or less than creating a spectrogram if you look into it and so on. So everything is learned really from the data. And I think that's the main difference between Machine learning. Yeah. All right. Learning. Well, I think now to keep us on track, we're going to take our second inning stretch um, and turn it over to Jay. Jay is a bit of a celebrity. He actually has already appeared. How many of you know the show 60 Minutes? He has already appeared on 60 Minutes talking about deep fake, and he'll explain a little bit about what that is and show some clips. Happy 7.15 in the morning, Jay. It's a wonderful time of day, and celebrity slightly overstates it. Let me share my screen and include audio, and I'll show you my claim to fame from a few weeks ago. All right. All it took was eight minutes. All right, and you can all hear that because I can hear the echo. So let me play this for you. And then at some point, of we'll me reading a script on camera for Synthesia to create my synthetic talking head complete with my gestures, head and mouth movements. Another company, Descript, used AI to create a synthetic version of my voice. This is Bill Whitaker's synthetic voice with my cadence, tenor, and syncopation. This is the result. The words you're hearing were never spoken by the real Bill into a microphone or to a camera. He merely typed the words into a computer and they come out of my mouth. It may look and sound a little rough around the edges right now, but as the technology improves, the possibilities of spinning words and images out of thin air are endless. I'm Bill Whitaker. I'm Bill Whitaker. I'm Bill Whitaker. Wow. Wow, indeed. And maybe a little rough around the edges at times, but I have... So as, as Heather briefly mentioned, we, we first met each other at DigiDesign and, and Avid. I worked on the Pro Tools team for about eight, eight, eight and a half years. I did a music and AI startup called Imagine Research for about four years. That startup was acquired by Isotope. I was at Isotope for a number of years. All this time, we've been trying to figure out how we can use AI to assist creators. And with what I'm seeing now, media production is now finally entering a phase where if you can dream something, it can actually happen. And you don't need an expensive studio or years of training. Actually, at this point, all you need is a laptop and a keyboard to realize what you want to have happen. And in the same way that Alex was saying how it can be uncomfortable that you don't have all these you know, specialty skills in order to create something, um, for, for creators, I look at that as incredibly liberating. So what you were just looking at was an example of something that we put together for 60 minutes. All of the audio was uh, created by uh, my company Descript. Now, some of the demos I thought 
you never probably see enough live demos. Let me show you a few live demos of what the state of the art is for synthetic media. The tool I'm going to be using is Descript to do this. That's the company I'm at. Uh, but this is going on in, in numerous other companies as well. Maybe not as well put together in my opinion, but let's just show you an, ex an example here. So uh, one of the things I've done, I actually, I have my own synthetic audio voice. This is called Overdub in Descript and it allows anybody and all of our users to create their own synthetic voice with as little as 10 minutes of training data. So here's me. It's an honor to present at the Audio Developer Conference. This is Jay's synthetic voice. He uses this to correct his editorial mistakes. So I can just type in whatever I want and my synthetic voice will speak and help me out. And I also use this for any podcasts I'm doing or for product demo videos. I'll record a voiceover and if I make a mistake, it's really as simple now as just selecting what you want, typing in what you want it to say, and we'll go in, we'll patch up the audio. So this is all synthetic. This is created, you know, Alex was talking about, uh, will it learn from machine learning approach or is it a deep learning approach where we learn from looking at spectrograms and waveforms? So everything I'm demoing today is actually based on either trained off of a spectrogram or oftentimes just the waveform. So if we have a synthetic media that is coming from uh, synthetic voice generation, this is pretty advanced. There's plenty of audio files in YouTube and podcasts that are out there that aren't using the real hosts. And for short periods of time, maybe 10, 15 seconds, we can insert sentences, two sentences, three sentences. You'll never be able to tell the difference between a human and the AI generated content. But this isn't the only use of synthetic media. I thought I'd show you a few other things. I said that media production is entering a phase. So not just speech synthesis, but media production. So a lot of people in this room are familiar with uh, all the tools like you know, automatic room tone generation and how, let's say you have a noisy background recording. If you insert a gap clip like here, you know, this is a period of silence between these two sentences. It's gonna sound artificial. Let me play you an example of what this sounds like. And you'll also hear what the original recording sounds like. When I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased. So you can hear there's some background noise in there. We can actually use deep learning to learn the room tone with one toggle. So this switch I'm using on the right, we're just saying analyze the room tone and synthesize it. So now let me, let me play that for both of these clips. Okay, turn on room tone here, hit play again. When I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased. Okay, now the, the next thing I'm gonna do is actually remove all of the background noise and make this sound like it was recorded on a studio quality mic. So the technology for doing that, yes, you could use a suite of EQs and compressors and limiters, and then use of your favorite D reverberation and background noise removal. But we have a technology called studio sound. The purpose of studio sound is to take a waveform and just make it sound like a professional broadcast audio. In many ways, it's a total black box. What we've done is just trained it on a lot of professional sounding recordings and just hope the system actually works to make it you sound like that professional recording. So uh, here's, let me play you what it sounded like before. When I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. And now I'll play you what it sounds like turning on studio sound. When I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased. So it's just cleaning up the audio and making it sound good. And the last thing you can do with this type of AI assisted technology, make yourself sound a little bit better. So even in just saying this, I've probably said um and ah way more times than I care to admit. I probably sound like this guy, Dave. What I'd add is uh, the cost of compute has come down enough that uh, these you can run very expensive deep neural nets uh, to do a lot of processing that you know even five years ago would have been uh, expensive. And you know now we're talking about. So a lot of what Dave is saying is getting lost in his message. So podcasters everywhere use tools like this. 
to do natural language processing and do things like I'm going to select remove filler words. So you can see all of the ums and ahs are reply are underlined. And now I can just go in. Also, he says, you know, that doesn't make sense. So I'm going to remove him saying, you know, and here's an extra ah, uh, remove that. Now let's see what Dave sounds like. What I'd add is the cost of compute has come down enough that these you can run very expensive deep neural nets to do a lot of processing that even five years ago would have been expensive. So when you mash all those together, I think I've demoed about six or seven places where we've used AI behind the scenes to help a content creator. And so that's, that, that's kind of a key message I want to impart to all of the audio developers out there. Sometimes you want to put your AI and say it's AI driven and it's, you know, make it front and center. I think the most important work you can do is actually have it behind the scenes and have it as an assistive technology. So that way people can just work creatively and creators can like remove all the friction between an idea and its expression and use AI for that purpose. Thank you, Jeff. All right, thank you. So we, we're allowed to go a little bit over, but we have a lot to cover in the next 20-ish minutes. So just really quickly, I think that Bobby can chime in and Harriet too. Let's just talk very briefly about AI used to create songs, right? I've heard that, um, and you can mention a little bit what's going on with Magenta, Bobby, because we've already had a panel with Saman. But uh, right now, it's possible to create a Rihanna-like song with a Rihanna-like voice. It is. Correct? It is, yeah. Um, so going back to what you were saying before, Heather, about how machine learning really isn't new. And actually, composers have been using it in music and, and, a, and a way of using algorithmic composition for hundreds of years. I mean, you can trace it back to Ada Lovelace. She wrote, I can't remember off the top of my head, but she wrote a fantastic quote about creating with algorithms and stuff. And, you know, over the hundreds of years that have come since then, we've really moved that on. Um, so we go back to 2000, you can look at people like David Cope. He wrote like an amazing book about algorithmic comp composition and how you can feed it with loads of training data. And it was mostly Western classical tradition stuff. It started like that because very simply, the copyright was free on those things. So the original stuff is very much, um, as you were saying before, Max, it's really hard to get good training data. and. We struggle with that too as musicians. We can't find stuff that will actually work to your specifics, like how you write music. And you know, music's very individual. So if you're trying to train something that will work for a lot of people, I think that's something that has been struggling with. But as you were saying before, Google Magenta is, um, first of all, it's open source, which is absolutely incredible for people like me who are really interested in researching it and want to move into actually, you know, using it in a... It's all available on Google's website. It is. Everything yeah. they've done in this area of AI-generated music, right? It's just incredible. It is, yeah. And they actually do a lot of um, generative sound synthesis as well. They have this thing called the Nsynth, which um, is absolutely amazing. I, mean, I don't know if you guys have ever been on the website and just played with their uh, um, web applications. You can just play with it, make new sounds. Um, you can feed it data to write new music. and. The biggest issue we had with writing music just using algorithms was that it didn't have any long-term structure. So it was really hard to get past, say, eight bars because, you know, a lot of Western music uses a sort of eight-bar structure and, that, you know, that's how a lot of people write music and stuff. But how do you get past those eight bars? At what point is it just looping? Are you just, like, coming up with one idea? And how, how do you move that forwards? And, you know, like with what Max is doing to help with mixing and stuff, that's an incredible way of moving forward and stuff. But yeah, what Google have done is tried to use um, some more autoencoders auto and transformers to on their neural networks and stuff. And yeah, that's where we're at at the moment. Neural networks, a whole other topic. So there's, this is an enormous topic, and we're trying to go fast and distill it. Bobby, did you want to add anything more on this topic, or should we go um, on to the legal issues to frame it this? I, I guess I would say it's uh, called tone, tone transfer, I believe, is the tech we're talking about here. Um, yeah. And um, I think, I don't know if that is that a TikTok that's used, but maybe stop by the bike dance booth downstairs, um, because I do believe you can check out, um, you can sing and then turn yourself into a cat. And I, I think <laughs> yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, but Sorry, yeah, so essentially, um, it's taking complex tones, allowing you to express yourself through something else. So you can speak, you, you can turn your singing voice into a saxophone. And I think the most exciting thing about tone transfer is that it treats transients differently than sustained tones. So you're actually getting like an expressive performance. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably the most interesting thing for me. Can I ask a quick question before we go to the legal stuff? Um, in terms of the composition AI, 
Are you aware of any working on the lyrics side? I know a few years ago, IBM were dabbling in that space yes. because actually lyrics is harder than notes and rhythm and, and melody. And I don't know if there's been any progress or leaps on, on, the, on the lyric composition side. Throw in like a word, boy, girl, fall in love, break up kind of thing? Yeah, well, I suppose just, <laughs> think, the English language doesn't make any sense, does it? So if you try, I mean, there are grammarians and syntacticians, syntacticians, is that right? Syntax people, yeah. who've been trying to code the English language. And rhyming, yeah. Um, for, for decades and, and without success. So, so actually yeah. getting a, a AI who can write, well, coherent lyrics, let alone good lyrics, yes. is, is quite a challenge. I like, I want to be like Bob Dylan-like, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know of anyone that's gotten to that point, you know? Yeah. yeah, being Bob Dylan, that would be amazing. That would be great. But um, In 15 minutes Yeah, I don't know if you've ever fallen down like a rabbit hole on YouTube. And there's actually like whole like, AI writes a book. And it's yeah. like this really horrible like text that doesn't actually meet. And they've obviously used like a really awful like sound synthesis to make yeah. it and stuff. And that's kind of what it's like with lyrics at the moment. Uh, I, did a very, I did a very little bit of like research on lyrics because I struggle to write lyrics. I'm a guitarist. I like just, you know, fiddling about the chords and stuff. Um, and I haven't found anything that's fully workable yet. But as I was saying before, like lyrics are so personable yeah. and they're so involved. I think it would be really hard to actually get something yeah. that people perceive as being uh, new, original, and also human-like. Or sometimes you want derivative. You want AI to create good derivative pieces, mm. right? Without infringing on copyright yeah. law. But what would be cool is if you could do that and then make your own lyrics. So, you know, maybe it comes up with ideas that you've not thought yeah. of. And yeah. then maybe you can put in, maybe that's where the trade off is. Uh, so instead of like replacing a lyricist, you could have them working in tandem yeah. to create new things. All right. I have to keep us going or else. No, no, no. We could, this could be a three, this could be an all day symposium. And I have attended those. And uh, we've got to make sure we cover the legal issues so Jay can talk about how they're trying to protect against deep fake. All right, would you please put up our favorite animal image? Okay. All right, anyone recognize this? That is not an AI-generated image of any of us, I can assure you. All right, do you want to kind of explain why this is the beginning? Well, interesting um, debate, wasn't it? And yes. you have five minutes here. Um, because I suppose when it comes to the legal side of AI, there are various different um, debates to be had. But it, looking at the copyright side of this, um, the minute AI is involved in the creative process, then the question is, well, can the output of that creative process be protected by this thing called copyright? And the reason why this is relevant is that this is a camera that was just uh, around these monkeys, and the monkey actually pressed the button on the camera, therefore created the photo. And that led to a debate in both the UK and the US as to whether or not there could be copyright in this image. Lots of people were using the image. Was Show of hands, how many copyright? people think uh, an animal gets copyright ownership? Yeah, so in the US, um, it actually went to the courts because Peter, the uh, what is it, People's Ethical Treatment of Animals, that was called. Oh yeah, Peter, right? Peter um, pursued a case on behalf of the monkey, um, <laughs> saying that his rights uh, should be respected. Handsome chap, really. Um, actually, in the end, um, that it, it it got settled out of court, yeah. so we didn't get any resolution in uh, the system. Although it, the, the way it was going in the American courts was that. Um, an animal cannot have copyright protection. But of interest, when the debate was going on in the UK, it didn't get to the courts in the UK, but there was debate in the UK um, around, okay, well, maybe the monkey can't have copyright protection, but does somebody have copyright protection? Is there someone else involved in this process who may be, as in a human being, who could have the copyright? And, and the debate was, well, maybe the owner of the camera. And the reason why that's relevant to this debate is that... This whole idea of if a machine creates something, can copyright possibly exist? Jay, you can come back if you want to show yourself, although we've enjoyed the, that picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, here in the UK, our copyright law from 1988, so I, I believe this actually went in in 1988. It was a rare bit of foresight on the behalf of our parliament, um, given that the entire section on data in UK copyright law just treats data as a literary work, because you mm -hmm. kind of think that Parliament could deal with data. But when it comes to um, computer-generated works, actually UK copyright law says if there is a computer-generated work that does have copyright protection, it is belongs to whoever's technology created it. Um, and then in terms of copyright term, it lasts for 50 years after release and, and creation. Um, so the argument was, well, if the law is already saying that a computer-generated work, it belongs to whoever's technology 
was used, then maybe in that case, the monkey created work would belong to whoever's technology was used, which would be the photographer who owned the camera. Um, but it has to be said that, I mean, once you go around the world, it's, it's very all much- over, It's all over the global map and undecided, yes. right? Well, and even here in the UK, just last month, the Intellectual Property Office began a consultation on this very topic around copyright issues around AI. And although technically we are one of the few countries where the law anticipates computer generated works, the IPO is asking the question, but should we? Um, should a computer generated work enjoy copyright protection? And actually, if you looked at this from a French perspective, because French copyright law and English copyright law are both very influential around the world for reasons of history, because copyright was kind of properly formalized in the 19th century when there were two empires in the world, French and British, um, and half the world ended up with English style copyright and half the world ended up with French style copyright. And French copyright law actually sees copyright almost as a human right. If you create a piece of music or a piece of literature, it is an extension of you as a human being. So it's just a given, of course, you should have control over that work. It's a human right. Whereas English copyright law, it's more about incentivizing creativity, rewarding creativity, and giving you control in order to do that. So if you look at it from a French perspective, what if it's a human right? If there's no human being, there can't be a copyright. Whereas I think from a UK perspective, because it's more about incentivizing creativity, where we're incentivizing creativity within the AI space, and so maybe there are grounds for having a copyright. Yeah. Well, what about the US? Are we keeping up in the way you think we should on this um, topic? Well, obviously, so US copyright law is much closer to English copyright law than it is to continental European. Moral rights. And, um, yeah. Having said that, um, so therefore, it, it is more about incentivizing creativity. You gave the definition of where it originates. So I think you know probably the US would take more of a similar viewpoint to, to the UK. Um, that said, you don't actually have it currently in law. And, and I mean, and this is being discussed. China, India, it is around the world. And we have papers we can share on this. I forgot to give credit. Um, our law clerk uh, intern, Aidan Bronfreck, helped write the intro to this. We have a blog we're putting out. You have an amazing paper. Yes. Which I can show in full Come depth on. in a second, if ago. I can hold it. That's getting updated. Yes. Right here. So we will uh, make available these resources, but now, we have to steer a little bit away I from copyright. I will say, there is ongoing consultations in the EU, UK, and WIPO, the World Industrial Organization, on this topic. So it is very much under debate. Exactly. Call for papers and all that. But lest you think copyright is the only issue, we've got this issue of right of publicity, right of privacy. And Jay can address it a little bit with Chris. Do you want to talk about this deep fake? How many people know about deep fake? And we saw a little bit of it. Okay, Jay, uh, can you talk just gently about how we've had to deal with a few issues where you've called me and um, what authentication procedures you have so you don't call the lawyers that much? Okay. Well, I mean, it also came up with that, that Bill Whitaker example, the 60 Minutes correspondent, because some of you watching this might be thinking, oh, well, that's fantastic. All I need to do is I can just create a deep fake voice of anybody I want and make them say whatever I want. Now there are open source tools out there and then there are companies that are operating that don't respect really the rules that people should have ownership of their own voice. The Descript takes a, a, a different approach. We want to assure our creators, anybody that uses the tools that you own and you control the use of your digital voice. And so working with the 60 Minutes team, for example, we needed Bill to first record a 30 second consent statement. Now that consent statement proves that you are a real live consenting human that consents to having your digital voice clone being made and make you aware that once it's created, only you will have access to it and it can be made to say pretty much anything. Uh, so you have to upload that consent statement and you also have to upload your 10 minutes or so of training data. We have people all the time that are trying to upload a faked consent statement of people, you know, trying to pretend they're a famous celebrity, and then they upload stuff that's clearly just snipped out of a movie. And so it's it's up to us to uphold our policy. Uh, we have another layer of AI in the background. So we have AI that does voice signature detection, kind of looks at the, the biometrics of your voice ID to see if the consent statement is the same as your training material. 
And then even from there, we have a human layer, people with headphones that are also listening to see if these things match up. And there's times like, there's time, pe people are always going to try to game the system, but I think it's to all of our benefit. We're, 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 we want to take the high road here and just give people their own voice. And, you know, we work with a lot of famous celebrities and screen actors and uh, YouTube personalities. They deserve the right to decide what to do with their voice. Thank you. All right, Chris, any other legal issues you think well, we should toss out before we take questions? Just very quickly, because I know we're tight on time. I think where well, that's fascinating is, obviously, in terms of copyright, when it comes to your, your visual image and your voice, well, copyright doesn't help you because copyright is about protecting the output of creativity. So as you mentioned, you then get into the realm of, of personality rights or publicity rights or Very image big rights. in the US. Um, but, but I suppose, whereas we've, okay, we've already discussed that there are differences in copyright law around the world, particularly around issues like this. So that different copyright systems are approaching this in different ways. But at least there is a global copyright framework. There are global copyright treaties. There is a division of the United right. Nations that brings the copyright systems together. I would say when it comes to personality rights, the variables around the world are much, much bigger. I mean, in the US, it's at state level, isn't it? So there isn't a federal policy. Right, and right. Uh, Hollywood, California, very protective so of your right to your image, likeness, voice. Differs yeah. from state to state in the US. Here in the UK, there's no such thing as personality rights. Oh, um, so I can use your voice. Well, so then it's like, well, how do I stop that? Now, uh -huh. some said, well, can trademark help? Maybe it can, maybe it can't. I'd think in the UK, you would go with the tort of passing off. Um, the closest we've got to a personality rights case in the UK involves Rihanna and Topshop, but that was a passing off case. And in the judgment, um, Rihanna won, but the judge said, this is not a personality rights case. They do not exist in the UK. This is a <laughs> passing off case. So I think I would have to sue you for passing off if, if you were to do it. But I, I, I might choose Morgan Freeman maybe <laughs> before you. But, uh, oh, but he's in the US. <laughs> well, he could still, I'm sure, sue you on the UK law if necessary. Um, so, so I think it's fascinating with personality rights because it's, it's um, an area of law where there isn't really a global consensus on what right. it should look like. And maybe there should be if or inspiring technologies like this are all, going to become readily available. All right. I think we could go on. Is anyone else on our panel dying to say something, or should we take questions? We're good with that? Does anyone have questions? Jay, do you? Uh, Bobby, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. I, I've Thank you all for uh, joining us. Absolutely. On I this have panel. questions, but I will defer to some online questions and take some from the audience as well. Um, let's start with an online question very quick. I've got a question from... Let's see, Anonymous. Anonymous says, um, are there any underlining biases in the models discussed today um, that have been identified um, and how would we address biases? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Woo. I mean, I can That's such a broad question. Do you think they mean biases in music? AI-generated music, perhaps? Yeah, the, the, there, is, there are huge biases. Yeah. I actually um, I, I did a little bit of research on that because, as I was saying before, a lot of the original uh, work came from the Western classical tradition, like I said, because there are no copyright issues, thanks to lawyers and stuff, you know? Um, yeah, so a lot of issues we have are biases, and it, it's, it's everywhere uh, at the moment. There's a great paper by some researchers called Stochastic Parrots that looks at how speech recognition can inherently be biased because the training data is inherently biased. And it's a complete coincidence and accident. And actually being aware of that is amazing. And we can do something about that now, you know, now that we're aware that that happens, maybe moving forward, we can, in, in the music industry, we can start to um, use more musicology from say um, India or Africa. Maybe we can get some Ghanaian drumming patterns made with AI, that would be so cool, right? Um, but yeah, th there is definitely inherently bias. And there, also, I suppose, where you, because there are the other uses of AI and music beyond what we've had time to talk about today, the other, for example, is recommendation, the recommendation yes. engines that people yeah. are developing and which are, as, as we shift over to voice control yeah. being the primary way we interact. Um, and yes, biases in recommendations could have massive impacts on, yeah. on massive. You know, what, yeah. what kinds of music are, are successful. Yeah. Um, does any, yes. Uh, well, questions from the audience. I'm yeah, sure Bo Bobby, you can handle the questions, but yeah, ask away, and we can go a few minutes um, over if you want. So, so. Your point of, you know, who controls the copyright if uh, you created um, something that's a result of AI? So you're the fact it's sort of the creator. Um, but would that could that also depend on whether you view 
uh, you know, whatever algorithm or platform you're using as an instrument, um, as a sort of a tool to sort of achieve goal of making music in the same way that we would with any musical instrument, but we wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, have to give any sort of copyright um, credits to the people who make our instruments. Mm -hmm. And also I was thinking about the, uh, on, on the subject of the monkey and the camera, um, I was just thinking that, um, would there not be a sort of precedent in the fact of maybe it being probably a little difficult for the monkey to sort of receive a settlement physically? Uh, in the same way, so, uh, sorry, I was, I was thinking about, um, in a similar case, uh, Beyonce's daughter has been credited in songs, but obviously she probably wouldn't be deemed. Well, in fact, that is one of the issues the courts have looked at. If they've, they've thought about when they're analyzing this and commentators, right, if it's not a person, who's going to bring the case in court? Who's going to collect the settlement, right? How, who represents on advocates on their behalf? The monkey had PETA, but uh, who's going to be advocating on behalf of the machine, right? Maybe the person who created the machine. Yeah. And I think the point... The is, standing, we call that kind of... And, yeah. In terms of... Because a debate at the moment is, should AI-created content have copyright protection at all? And there were some people who would say no. And actually, some people would say the job of copyright is to protect human creativity over the threat of machine creativity. But if you were looking for arguments as to why it should have protection, then yes, I think if you could say, well, not only was a human being involved in creating the AI technology, another human being then filled out some criteria, pulled in some source materials, and then used the AI. So there was enough creativity going on when the technology was used that we say, therefore, copyright should exist, and it should belong to the person who entered all of that. But then there are, I mean, I've used platforms where I upload a video into the service, and that's literally all I do, and it creates soundtrack for the video. Okay, that technology is out there. I don't think me uploading a video file could really count as creative. <laughs> and creative then you get work. the money, right? Here's well, the question yeah. of who gets so, the compensation. So, exactly. So yes, you'd have to identify who the first owner was, at the very least. And yes, and that would have to be somebody who could go to a court of law and enforce their rights. Could you say it's like a similar debate uh, to the sort of the sampling one, I guess, you know, to how, you know, like how much of a you know, if you're, if you're making a song and you use parts from another... I would say that, yeah, I mean, that's related but different in that that's how much substance does there need to be for copyright to kick in, isn't it? You know, can you have copyright in two beats? It's basically the question in sample cases. Um, where, so that's, again, I suppose it is about effort, but it's also, it's a, I think that's, that's less about effort and more about originality, okay? Because in order for there to be copyright, there has to be originality, and the, can there be originality in two beats? I mean, actually, in some American cases, I think they've decided that there can be, but I would argue There's no that de can't. minimus amount you can use. That's a whole yeah. other topic, yeah. right? It just depends what those two beats are, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. yeah. An opening riff can be very powerful on a song, but that's a whole other yeah. topic. So, um, okay, well, while, while we have these experts here, I, this is ADC. I thought you guys might go a little deeper into data sets and what kind of, how to go about the actual creating of these applications or not. We love that you like the legal questions, right? Yeah. Here I'm we good, go. Good yeah. Got an answer today. <laughs> yeah, so I have a, a question about um, creativity. So how do you define define creativity? Do you do you need uh, some sort of consciousness to be creative? And also the the models. I mean, it's just mathematical models that are interpolating and learning and so on. And I mean, can a computer create something new, or does it just do some kind of interpolation between data? And that is a, the question we are trying to solve, or the courts are yeah. trying to solve. Well, and I think it is, when you think about intelligence, consciousness, creativity, these are all words which nobody has really successfully defined. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose if you define them as saying, well, what the human brain does subconsciously is gathers together data and looks for patterns mm -hmm. and then learns from those patterns, well, that is what the machine is doing, just with a much bigger data set. Um, but if you say, actually, no, it's more than that, there's some spark that we can't really define, then a machine can't do that. Um, but yes, I mean, it, all of these are, how do we define these different terms? Um, and I guess ultimately it will come down to, do we want to protect AI, 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 hang on, AI created works? And I think there will be artists and musician and songwriter groups who may well say no, because it's a threat. 
I think it would be fun to take a poll and see where we stand when we do this panel in a few more years on this topic. You want to do, can you frame the issues for a poll for the audience? Right now? I yeah. suppose, yes. I mean, should, I mean, yeah, simple question is, should an AI created composition, so let's assume there was minimal human involvement at the start. Mm -hmm. Okay, I uploaded a video and it created it. Should that piece of music be protected by copyright in the same way as if, you know, a talented musician had composed something originally? Should it have the same protection? Um, uh, so, every... hands up if you think yes. Okay, so that's about a quarter of the room. Okay. I think some of the, it'll be fun to see, maybe next panel we'll play some AI generated music and that will help frame the discussion, right? Mm -hmm. How creative is it? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then obviously, if you are a company creating soundtracks with an AI, of course you want protection. Did you raise your yeah. hand, Jay? I, I don't want to influence the audience. I have a bigger screen. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, like I uh, think what you just said is interesting because in my world, which is not so much thinking about the creative side of AI, whatever, mm -hmm. but I think if a company builds the system that's able to create like elevator music for whatever, yeah. like it's totally fair that this company, because they put all the effort into building the thing, can sell this. So there is, um, so it's, so probably they own the rights uh, and give the rights to the user who generates the work. Um, so that no other one can copy it, but the user who just uploaded the, the, the video is not the original creator, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. I, I think it would be wrong somehow to say no one ever can copyright anything with AI involved because at the end it's, it's a tool, at least right now, and, and you could not say, okay, you, like, this is created with a synthesizer, so it, this, is, this belongs to output, you know, because they created the synthesizer, so it would be strange, and no one would do that. And it somehow it feels like this if you would um, say, okay, the, the tool creator, um, like the one who creates uh, could never ever get the copyright on, on, on what he or she does. But Alex, yeah. let's give an example, and then I know we have to wrap this up. Someone is using your tools to improve the quality of the songs they create, right? You're filling in a lot of blanks, or you could use a better word, right? It's your tools are designed to help people make better songs. Should should you have any, let's say your tools get more advanced and you have more influence in the song's creation, should you have any ownership in the songs? Absolutely no. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Because um, we, we don't, like, we see our tools as, as, as helpful tools to, to, to be creative, but we would never ever claim ownership of the thing that's done with the tools. So, But we, is there a parallel with what... What if you're generating it, sounds for people? Well, because interestingly, yeah. in the studio, mm -hmm. sound engineers, mastering engineers, generally are, I do a job, I'm paid to do the job, I make the music better. Whereas the producer increasingly is looking for a co-creation right. credit and co-ownership of the copyright. All these rights, right, yeah. and getting so producers rights. producers are seeing yeah. actually, no, my process actually is, I am a creator in the studio, I should be cut into the right. So then you get into, well, is your technology, in essence, doing what an engineer would do, or is it doing what a producer would do? Um, yeah. and, and are we saying if the human being would get right. proper We're just doing this as a hypothetical yeah, no, example it's, it's, it's as you get more sophisticated. Thing. And, and I had just yeah. recently, today I had a discussion uh, with someone sitting here, and, and we also talked about this thing, like is there a copyright on generated, uh, AI generated music and so on. Yeah. And one thing that came up is, okay, if I learn from all the artists around the world and then they generate something, no one could ever have like claimed the right that because one, one million trillion, uh, trillions of, of the work comes from my work. But if, for example, some famous artist would say, okay, I work with the company, I give them all my music, you're allowed to train your AI on my music, and then the company can sell things like sound like X, Y, right. and, the, and the artist could get uh, really royalties for offering really his style, his yeah. individual style. So this could be even a, like a business model in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think there yeah. could be things coming up if, if people Probably. want to take a break, I think we'll continue this for five minutes, if that's okay. There's an opportunity. We've got some great questions. Um, you know, there's, a, there's sort of a joke. If you ask a lawyer a question, the answer always is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so you are seeing, especially in this field, it depends. There's a lot of variables to consider. And now I think Alex is considering <laughs> <laughs> new models. <laughs> no. All right. Um, you you know flashed what? something up, Bobby. There's lots of stuff. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask a personal question here. <laughs> um, we worked on a lot of trade dress stuff together, Heather, and this is before there were GANs. So now you've got these, you know, general adversarial networks creating things through AI. And I'm just thinking back to the work we did. You know, what if we took 
two competitors' UIs, shoved it through again, and had to create something. And then we just released a product. And then, you know, what, what does that turn into? And I asked this from the from thinking of the early stage of generative design, say from yeah. Autodesk, when they had this thing called Dreamcatcher, where you were taking one glass and another glass, and both are protected designs from their manufacturers to give a glass in the middle. And then their software was allowing you to take you through the patent process of patenting that design. All right, well, Chris will chime in. The <laughs> This is kind of questions that I examined years and years ago yeah. on reverse engineering and interoperability. In this case, in order to do run it through the machine you just mentioned, you would have to actually literally make a copy. And so that making of a copy would be considered uh, it depends if someone asked me to argue the other side of this, I could do it as well. <laughs> so uh, arguably, the original making of a copy would be copyright infringement unless it was being done for a fair use purpose. So if it was being done for purposes of interoperability, um, probably could help that client get out of that issue of the initial copy. But in this case, it's to make a combined GUI, right? Well, no, it's, uh, I, I mean, I'm following what you're saying, but what if I'm nefarious and I, I'm not going to tell you what those two inputs were. So let's say the first thing was a fork and the, that was a, well, a, pa a patented thing and another patented thing that have nothing to do with each other. And the result in, in between is something useful and interesting to me, but I didn't create it. The GAN did. I mean, okay. well, patents, we haven't even talked about patents. Patents but, are hard to I, get around. But, but, but yeah. I'm curious because this is coming to music, right? So if we think about it, you know, with Magenta's tools, I mean, in the case of how it's learning from, say, a Chopin etude, and then you turn that over, and then on the other side, it's something by Rachmaninoff, and, you know, you have very little input, and it's going to try to do something in between, but it's mine. I made it, or I didn't make it. No, I suppose that comes to, which we alluded to earlier, is what accessing data to, to teach your AI. Um, and I mean, it's actually, there was something in the European Copyright Directive about this, which I must admit, I've not completely got my head around in terms of having an exception for data mining. Um, but I, I suppose but what the music industry would say is, before you put any of my recordings or songs into your tool for training, right. you need a license. Mm -hmm. Now, some would argue there are exceptions, maybe it's fair use in the US or it's an explicit Could exception. use public domain songs, right? Um, but, yeah. but I, a label would say, a publisher would say, no, you can't do that without a license. Yeah. Um, and at the point at which we do a license, we then discuss everything that you've just But no, about. I guess my point was, and I, and I won't drag this on, but just to say that what if the two inputs were so unrecognizable or so dissimilar that the resultant is nowhere near what well, A so, so, so there's, there's two things where, yeah. which is A, Yes, obviously. If you went to litigation route, then you would subpoena that information. Right. In the discovery ahead. process, no matter what, you could not shield what the original steps were. But your question were. is, how would we even know? Yeah. Um, and and I suppose someone will invent an AI technology that can... I mean, you know, th there have been lawsuits <laughs> in the US courts based on content ID. Right. Copyright owners have had a YouTube alert telling them that a song they'd never heard of is very similar to a song they own. And, and at least in the U.S. courts, I'm allowed to say I need to know exactly how you began this process, and you have to show me how you did it. Well, so, and, and to throw and throw a wrench into that, um, on a project I worked on called Hackrod, um, the inputs were car chassis from many different manufacturers. That was the input, but the input on the other side was a bird's nest, and the resultant was a new frame that we were able to patent or at least have the design IP for. So it really brings in all these questions of like what is possible and what is protectable, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> it um, depends. There, there are at least five questions online. I'd love to move those all to the Discord, just so you know. And uh, Is there one you want to ask? Do you want us to um, give five second responses? Well, let me look at the room. See, we're, we're going to have to wrap up. So if there's one more in the room, we'll take it, and we'll move all the questions to Discord and ask you to please yeah. go to Discord and answer those. Yeah, um, I, um, I find it really pro problematic, um, sort of giving um, total copyright to AI. <laughs> we have so many um, just biases in the actual sort of building of, of, of music, actually in the music industry, not, not just, just, just <laughs> um, as a woman. I mean, I, I mean, the thought of kind of like giving the act of music creation over to a computer when you just look at the audience and uh, how many women are in the audience now. Um, and I'm a disabled person as well. <laughs> so, uh, and you, uh, I just I just find it deeply problematic when you think about you're talking about human rights. Uh, so where are human rights and music 
here, <laughs> you know, yeah. in this discussion. And, and it's temperature, isn't and, it? <laughs> Well, do you want to come in and then... Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I just like, quickly, because um, this was a huge thing when I was researching, because I was like, what's the point? If this exists, why, why do I exist as a musician? You don't need me, bye. I'll just, you know, work in a cafe, I guess. You know, it's fine. Um, but there are actually a lot of companies nowadays who are focusing on the collaboration. So there's um, a Luxembourg-based company called Ava, and they do a lot of, like, they've basically removed the musician. And the backlash from that was huge. Because they were like, you can use it in game audio development. You, you don't need the composer anymore. Woo, yay, saves money or whatever. Um, but the problem with that is you're taking someone's livelihood away, as you said. And um, the diversity issue, it's huge. So if you're taking it away from someone who needs that as well, it's just a, a huge problem. But what I, what I was proposing with my research is that we move towards collaboration on creativity. And I think that ties in lovely what you guys were saying. Because, yeah, we don't copyright, say, when I write a piece of music, I'm not giving the person who made the audio workstation I'm working with copyright. They don't own that. Same way the guitar I play, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, thanks, Ibanez, do you want some money? Because at the end of the day, I bought it. And I think, for me anyway, as a musician, that's where I see it. Because I'm collaborating with the computer, I always think, well, maybe it does have rights. And maybe inherently, say, if Max, if I use your system with mixing, maybe you do have rights to that system as well because you you were involved in the creative process. Um, maybe more so as like a producer or engineer in your case, but um, I think that's where the line, that's, that's what I try and say, think in my head anyway to get my head around it um, when I'm using it and stuff like that. It, it, it is such an interesting discussion over the long run because I think everyone in this room, right, we used to define our purpose as facilitating the creativity of humans, right? You're making tools, right, audio engineers, that are going to help facilitate the creative process. And so now with AI, right, it's just taking us on a tangent and uh, it's raising a lot of issues. I don't know, closing thoughts on this topic? I mean, every time I meet somebody working, particularly in the, the music creation AI, that is always my question is, well, are you going to put artists and songwriters out of business? And they will always, every, every single one I've ever interviewed, Say, no, 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 we're about providing tools that right. facilitate yeah. the creative when, process. When DigiDesign began, it was really about democratizing, making tools more f affordable. You didn't need the big Neve SSL analog consoles. You didn't need tape machines, right? It was about making it easier and accessible. Yeah. So said, are we going in a different trend now? Well, I think that is still very much part of it. And I think that's very much the motivation of most of the technologies being created. But I think it is inevitable that some music will end up being machine created because it's cheaper. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a threat for production music, for example. Um, and I, I can see that, you know, ByteDance and TikTok have got some interesting stuff going on. Maybe some of the music that creators are using in that app will be machine created, so then they don't have to license that music. So I, I, so I think it's, it is both a huge opportunity and it's very exciting, but I think the, the issue you've raised is an entirely legitimate issue that lawmakers are going to have to consider. Could it as, be the case that actually it's an opportunity for, like, better employment on, in, the, in, the, in the industry. So you get more women, more disabled people, kind of like just a, a more diverse industry. So, and, and just actually make it, make it standard practice that, that you won't actually make anything unless you, you have a, a really diverse background of programmers and then people's voices and uh, it kind of becomes a it, because it is an ethical issue it is it is, <laughs> so it is. unfortunately we are 15 minutes past the time i think these are really good topics to c carry forward right uh, maybe work by in an inevitably creating less work for musicians more work for audio programmers what's the proper balance i want to thank our panelists any last words on this topic well, I think like the, there is a lot of opportunities ahead using new technologies, but at the same time, it's important that you, also we as developers are responsible, like we, we know that we have a responsibility in how we use the tools that, that are there, because every, every new invention can be used in a great way and in a terrible way. Uh, and I think being conscious about that is important. Yeah, I, I agree. I think in the future, I think we should try and hold an optimistic outlook on these things. So yes, like you said, you can be evil with it and replace people but I don't think that's the view I, I want to think about because that would make me really sad every day right if I'm just thinking about my jobs going so I think it's important to hold a positive and optimistic 
worldview on these things because machine learning is so new and, uh, and it's now becomes because it's coming to the forefront more with now that machines are a lot faster with it. Um, I would just say stay positive on it and use right. it. So thank you, Alex Sonable. Thank you, Hillary. Jay, Descript, anything to uh, add besides I'm, free versions of your software? I'm also hugely optimistic. Really, we're, we're at a wave where the, the next generation of storytellers and creators, and I mean, at the end of the day, we're all storytellers. We've actually never had it so good with access to these tools. So it's the responsibility of us all as developers and tool manufacturers to make sure we address the biases in our training sets, in our software, and that we're including voices of all the type of creators we want to support in the development process. Um, but at the end of the day, as far as the tool use, this this is like, this is the new glory days. This is going to be exciting. And if you want those free copies of software, here's my call to action. Uh, and by the way, the blog, the blog, we have great technical. So if those of you want to understand the generative media piece, we have good explainers on how the overdub technology technically works. Um, so check out our blog and for some good stories. Thank you so much for getting up so early for us, Jay. Chris, any last words? To maintain the optimism, I think all of these technologies have potential to remove barriers, don't they? So actually, there was a very big positive there, that more people can be involved in the creative process, more people can get that creative out there. But I would totally agree, the challenge is, when all of this starts generating revenue, is how do we make sure that that money is being fairly shared out? That's partly copyright law, it's partly the way the industry works, um, it's partly contracts. And it, I suppose it is one part of a much, much bigger debate. But I think, you know, it is very exciting. Um, but I think we're going to be having these debates at this event for a number of years. <laughs> but thank you, Bobby. Any last words? He is downstairs. OK. Oh. <laughs> so I want to thank, I really want to thank, we're getting to the end of a two-day program for ADC. I think uh, I want to thank Pace, who has taken over for this, for inviting us all. I think they've done a fantastic job. Just a round of applause, because we're all back together in person. Um, and it's, it's just such creativity. It's just wonderful. And I want to thank uh, all our panelists and Jay for getting up early. I want to thank um, my law firm, some of whom are here, and uh, Rafter Marsh for helping to continue the dialogue and making me seem a little smarter um, with what they prepared me to, on this topic. We, we will put into script where you can find further information on this topic, including your writings. Yep. And most of all, I want to thank you, uh, the developers and participants, for creating these tools that are raising all sorts of exciting new issues uh, from a human perspective point of view, machine perspective, and legal issues that are going to keep us busy for a long, long time. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you all. And please support Women in Audio, Sound Girls, and all those other good organizations promoting diversity. That's it. <laughs>